Good evening, and thank you all for joining us today for the 2019 inaugural ceremony. Please be seated. On behalf of the Governor, Lieutenant Governor, State Comptroller, and Attorney General, we welcome all of you and formally convene today's inaugural proceedings. Please welcome Rabbi Arthur Schneier of Park East Synagogue to deliver the invocation. Happy New Year! I'm a Holocaust survivor. For me, the uh, Ellis Island and Statue of Liberty is a high point in my life. After the war, I decided to leave my birthplace, Vienna, Austria, not the United States, in search for the American dream. And little did I think when I arrived here on May 8th, 47, that I would have the privilege of um, blessing a uh, grandson of immigrants, Andrew Cuomo, also a dream fulfilled in the presence of his mother and friend and family. So you find that throughout the ages of the United States, the oppressed, the persecuted, the deprived, for searching for the American dream. And that dream is represented by the four freedoms. Freedom of worship, freedom of speech, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. We are blessed we enjoy those freedoms. But freedom from fear has been compromised by the scourge of terrorism, 9-11, bigotry, racism, anti-Semitism. And we count on Governor Andrew Cuomo and all responsible leaders, city, state, nation, to fight the plague that is breaking our society. We count on you to restore freedom from fear to all Americans. When all of us will feel secure, none of us will have to be afraid. But leaders cannot do it alone. We all have to help them. Let us not take freedom for granted. It must be cherished, guarded, and preserved. And be alert so that the unity and diversity that we enjoy will continue to be the hope for the world. God created an imperfect world. It's up to all of us to help perfect that world. To perfect an imperfect world, all of us could make a difference. So we thank God for the leadership and dedication of Governor Andrew Cuomo. You have gained the trust of New Yorkers, not once, not twice, third or in, you know, third inaugural. You can bless it. So you agree with me? 
Come on. We recognize Controller Thomas DiNapoli, the veteran guardian of our treasury, and uh, we welcome two tested public servants to the team of New York State leadership, Lieutenant Governor Kathleen Hoko and Letitia James. Leticia, I told you, you're always number one. <laughs> but they all need our trust, our support, and confidence. Now, every Saturday, not only in my synagogue, Parkey Synagogue, but every synagogue, we invoke God's blessings upon men and women who faithfully occupy themselves with the needs of the community. I say it in Hebrew. Misha Orshim Betzoche Tzibu Be'emuna, who faithfully occupy themselves with the needs of the community. And we pray to God and join me in that prayer. May the Holy One give them their reward and send blessings and success to all the work on their hands. And let us all say, Amen. And finally, together, God bless America. Say it. God bless America with unity, peace, and prosperity. And oh God, grant all of us a blessed, fruitful, and happy new year. And let us all say, Amen. Thank you. Please rise and remain standing for the posting of the national and state colors by members of the New York Army National Guard, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led by New York Army National Guard Specialist Christopher Allen, and the singing of the national anthem by the Greater Allen Cathedral AME Choir, featuring soloist Stephanie Fisher. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, a nation under God, indivisible with liberty and freedom. So proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. How oh, say does that star spangled
At this time, may we have Reverend Anthony L. Trufant of Emmanuel Baptist Church step forward and administer the oath of office to Letitia A. James as Attorney General of the State of New York, accompanied by former Mayor David Dinkins and former Assembly Member Annette Robinson. Permit me to say, as your pastor and as a resident of the Fort Greene Clinton Hill community, how proud we are of you. Thank you, Thank you for permitting me to be a small part of your special day. You have made history not once, not twice, but three times. Yeah. You're surrounded by persons who are history makers, but as you enter office, never forget that you did not set out to make history. You set out to make a difference. And it is my hope and prayer that as you enter this office and occupy it, not simply in this single instance, but for many years to come, that you will leave the people of the state of New York better than when you found us. Protect liberty and promote justice, not simply for some, but rather for all. The oath of office, if you'll repeat after me, I, I Letitia A. James, Letitia A. James. Do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of of the Office of Attorney General. The Office of Attorney General. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. God bless you and God keep you. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone may be seated. Now please welcome the Attorney General of the State of New York, Letitia A. James. Allow me to thank my pastor, Reverend Anthony L. Trufant of Emmanuel Baptist Church, the former assembly member Annette Robinson, thank you for praying with me this morning, to the former mayor David Dinkins, and to, of course, I want to congratulate Governor Andrew Cuomo, Controller DiNapoli, uh, my friend, Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul, and I'd like to recognize all of the dignitaries who are here today and my family members. But I do want to make a special recognition to Barbara Underwood, who took the mantle. She took the mantle of this great position and in a short period of time battled giants on our behalf. And we are all grateful. And I am so grateful that you will be staying on as a Solicitor General of the great state of New York. 
It is my profound honor to stand before you today and to pledge my service to you, the people of the great state of New York, as your Attorney General. And like so many, I came from humbled but determined beginnings. You see, my parents came here from southern backgrounds and they raised their children in New York City to basically give us a better chance. And they weren't privileged, but they certainly were blessed. And I imagine that they would be very proud to see me today as they beam down from heaven. And I recognize that we stand today on hallowed ground, blessed with the sacrifice of resistors and dreamers who refuse to bow to traditional rule, seated with the dreams of millions of Americans, refugees leaving their nations of birth for a brighter future under the torch of Lady Liberty, as well as those like my parents who simply saw their destiny and seized their shot at the American dream. And unfortunately, too many Americans find that dream slipping from their reach. The rights and dignity of everyday people are being trampled by the most powerful amongst us. We see powerful corporations who act like they are above the law. We see profiteers and politicians risking the hard-earned security of working people in the pursuit of greater wealth and power. We see corruption eating away at the bedrock of our society. And too often, we feel powerless to respond. But today, my friends, we take that power back. Today, we respond. I believe in the rule of law and democracy and the expectation that in the eyes of government you shall be treated no worse than your neighbor on the right and no better than your neighbor on the left. The law is the great equalizer and the greatest pillar of our democracy, the greatest force against government inertia and entrenchment. I will work in a legal system where even the most powerful in the country cannot use a loophole to evade justice. I will fight for a law that codifies a woman's right to choose. And defends and defend our reproductive freedom. I will crack down on government officials who abuse the public trust. And I will take on corporations that pollute our air and our water, that defraud taxpayers and harm consumers. And I will protect the rights of women and immigrants and members of the LGBTQ communities. And communities of color and anyone targeted by the wrath of bigotry and hate. And I will focus on working with the state legislature to reform a broken criminal justice system <laughs> and ensuring that young black and brown children are not held back by a system that is stacked against them. And to all survivors of sexual assault, I cannot heal your wound, but I can stand with you and fight with you and march with you out of the darkness into the light. You will no longer be invisible in my eyes. And I will shine a light into the murkiest of swamps and act as a steward of justice for every New Yorker. You see, leaders worth their salt are here to protect those who are vulnerable and seek justice on their behalf. And that is a promise I make to each and every one of you, to New York teachers and nurses and preachers
and parents and construction workers and firefighters and police and soldiers and factory workers from Buffalo to the Bronx, from Rochester to Riverhead, I am here to promote meaningful change, to keep our families safe and moving forward and to advance justice at every turn. And I will keep you and your community held firmly in my heart and mind as I walk into work every day, guided by the principles of my faith, of Micah, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly in the company of God. And to those who aim to test or break the law on our watch, to challenge the dignity and security of our great state and its people, you have an opponent. And you better believe, as someone who's from Brooklyn, that I am battle-tested. So thank you so much for this honor and the opportunity to humbly serve each of my fellow New Yorkers. And now I look forward to getting to work. And I thank each and every one of you for this honor. God bless America and God bless New York. Thank you so much. At this time, may we have Jenny Rivera, Associate Judge of the New York State Court of Appeals, step forward and administer the oath of office to Thomas P. DiNapoli as Comptroller of the State of New York. P. DiNapoli, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of New York, and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of, of the office of, Controller of the State of New York, Controller of the State of New York, according to the best of my ability. Going to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Please welcome the Comptroller of the State of New York, Thomas P. DiNapoli. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friends and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be back once again. Thank you, Justice Rivera, very, very much for doing the honors of swearing me in. It really is a privilege for me to continue to serve the people of this great state as controller. Congratulations to all of my colleagues in government, especially the colleagues in state government, the members of the legislature who were elected last uh, November, as I was, to my partners in statewide office, to our great, she's already off to a great start, Letitia James, Attorney General of the State of New York, my good friend. We have a lot of work to do together. To uh, a real class act and someone who I have the privilege to travel across the state with, we end up in the far corners of New York. What a privilege to serve with our great Lieutenant Governor, Kathy Hochul. And of course, it's an honor to serve along with a governor who has truly made his mark, has set the standard for progressive leadership, not only here in the state of New York, but has set the standard nationally as well. Governor Andrew Cuomo, congratulations to you. Look forward to working with you once again. My commitment to the people of the state of New York is to do my job with independence and integrity. I think that's what people expect from all of us in elective office at a time where issues of transparency and accountability are uppermost in people's minds, the Office of Controller is uniquely situated to advance that agenda. And of course, I take as a very solemn responsibility and obligation to protect the pensions and the retirement security of the 1.1 million New Yorkers who are part of our pension system. I see a few of you out there as well. 
So to all, to you and your families, happy, healthy New Year, and let's get to work for the people of the state of New York. Thank you so much. At this time, may we have Paul Feynman, Associate Judge of the New York State Court of Appeals, step forward and administer the oath of office to Kathleen C. Hochul as Lieutenant Governor of the State of New York, accompanied by Bill Hochul, Katie Hochul and Matt Gloudman, and Will Hochul and Christina Gervasi. Solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and of the State of New York. And of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the duties of the office of Lieutenant Governor of the State of New York. The office of Lieutenant Governor of the State of New York. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Please welcome the Lieutenant Governor of the State of New York, Kathleen C. Hochul. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> How sweet it is. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And before I begin uh, some brief remarks, I do want to acknowledge the countless dignitaries who grace us with their presence here on this very special occasion for all of us being sworn in today. So first, I want to acknowledge all the members of the Court of Appeals. I want to acknowledge Congressman, former Congressman Charlie Rangel, and all my former colleagues in Congress. Uh, for those of you who waited a long time, everything changes on Thursday. You kept the faith, so uh, the happy days are here again in, in the U.S. House of Representative with Leader Pelosi. So to my friends in Congress, my esteemed friends in the state legislature who've joined us today, former Mayor David Dinkins, Mayor Bill de Blasio. This is what a warm swearing in looks like, Mayor. I remember yours a year ago. Uh, also, Mayors Mike Spano, Kathy Sheehan from Albany. Our New York City Comptroller, Scott Stringer, has joined us here as well, Scott. Uh, county Executives, Ballone and Curran and Latimer and Hine, thank you for making the journey here today. <laughs> Borough Presidents Brewer, 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 I'm sorry, Gail, and Ruben Diaz Jr. has joined us as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Former Lieutenant, Bob, Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy, thank you for coming down from Rochester today, Bob. Great to see you again. Our partners in local government, my brothers and sisters in labor, please give yourselves a round of applause. You've been awesome. And the members of our incredible administration, you are the best and the brightest that this country has to offer. Uh, first of all, thank you, Judge Feynman, for joining us today for this special occasion and uh, adding your clout to this event. Uh, again, I do want to give congratulations uh, to Tom DiNapoli. We have met every single cow in Wyoming County. Uh, we've been every corner of the state. You are there, and I just want to commend you for the way you've conducted yourself with such incredible integrity. I want to thank you for your service, Tom. And my dear, dear, dear friend, Tish James, Yes, you are my warrior on the campaign trail. You are battle tested, and I'd go into a foxhole with you any day, sister. Thank you very congratulations. Congratulations. To my incredibly patient family, I think this is my 10th or 11th swearing in, I don't know. Uh, my husband, Bill Hochul, of 35 years this year. Let's give it up for Bill. My son, Will, his fiance, Christina, daughter, Katie, husband, Matt, and my loyal and hardworking staff, Jeff Lewis, my chief of staff, and Melissa Vachensky is here today as well. So, uh, and also, most importantly, Governor, I thank you for the extraordinary opportunity to serve as your apartment in governing this incredibly complex but incredibly fascinating state of New York. So, Governor Cuomo, thank you again for being at my side. 
And I do want to acknowledge your mother. Uh, it was just a few months before I was sworn in four years ago that I lost my mother. And I feel that Mrs. Cuomo Matilda has stepped in as a surrogate and made me feel so welcome and part of your beloved family. So thank you. Our former First Lady, my good friend, Matilda Cuomo. It's been incredible to serve with an individual who believes, as I do, that our sole purpose in the roles we play is very simple, just to better the lives of other people. And we've achieved unprecedented social and economic progress just in the last four years since we were sworn in on this very day in 2014. We will build on that foundation of accomplishment over the next four years. We'll continue to use the gift and indeed the power of public service to make everyone who brags of being a New Yorker know that their tomorrows will indeed be better than their yesterdays. Whether their ancestors were among the millions who started a new life in these very halls, or they came involuntarily on a slave ship. For as Martin Luther King reminded us, we may have all come on different ships, but today we're all in the same boat. An ex <laughs> and exactly 90 years ago, 90 years ago, one of those ships transported a 19-year-old Irish lass, Mary Brown, who came here with the hearts filled with hopes and dreams and leaving the impoverished life that was surely her destiny. And her Ellis Island record, which I happen to have since we're at Ellis Island, uh, tells us she was brown-haired, five foot four, had no disease, and spoke English. It's all recorded here. And as her experience as a new American unfolded, she worked as a domestic servant. She assembled airplane parts in a factory to help the war effort. She married a man from her home village who worked a back-breaking job as a migrant worker, found his way to a steel plant, and ultimately they raised eight children in a two-room house where all the kids slept in the attic. But if you asked her, she had achieved the ideal American dream for her children, built companies, became educators, became school superintendents, and even served in the military so proudly. And her granddaughter became a member of Congress and today made history as the very first female Democratic Lieutenant Governor elected to a second term. Thank you. Thank you. This place, this place, Ellis Island, gave her and my grandfather that new beginning. So today, I recommit as I stand before you, as I stand before God with the oath I just it was administered. I will continue to use her struggles and the struggles of my own mother as an inspiration to continue fighting for the women of this state. Because the women of this state deserve to live the New York promise, to earn equal pay for equal work. Yes, indeed. To have affordable and accessible quality childcare so they can take their place among the ranks of the working have access to good-paying jobs without fear of discrimination or sexual harassment or assault just because they show up to work. And they deserve a good education from pre-K all the way to college, no doubt about it. And they deserve protection for their reproductive rights. And while my grandparents and countless others before them and after them found a better life here. It was not a perfect life, not a perfect life, which is why New York, the New York story continues to be defined by the courage and the advocacy of people like the early suffragettes and the abolitionists and the people, the advocates for the people with disabilities and fought for criminal justice and fought for the LGBTQ community. 
and fought for civil rights and to this day still continue. For that is the legacy we as New Yorkers embrace. It's part of our DNA. It's who we are. As I said, we have an obligation that is crystal clear. It is so simple. The governor and I pledge to better the lives of others. We come here renewed, re-energized, recommitted. For our indeed, that is our destiny of leaders of this incredible state. So as you leave here, listen to the ghosts of those who came before in Ellis Island, those who are marginalized, persecuted, impoverished. They came here with that same promise of a better life. As we begin a new year, as we begin a new term, that is the same promise that we will keep for today's generation and those that follow. Thank you very much. Will you now please turn your attention to the screens for a special video presentation. Throughout his entire life, Andrew Cuomo has had the same values and the same principles. The incredible thing that I don't think people realize about the governor is that every single fight he's fighting today, he's been fighting for 40 years. There's a cord that connects us all. That connects you to you to you to you. It doesn't matter if you're black or you're white or you're rich or you're poor. Or how much money you have in your pocket. That's what the Statue of Liberty promised when she stood in New York Harbor. And that torch must shine brighter than ever before. I've known Andrew Cuomo since he was a neighbor, a little boy, living around the corner in Holliswood. The values of Mario and Matilda gave him the values and the commitment to ensure that every youngster has the opportunity to soar. And the truth is that Andrew Cuomo worked his way through college and law school, working at places like repair shops and, uh, and in construction. The greatest thing about the Cuomos is that they never forgot that they were immigrants. He saw and felt the stings of discrimination and stereotyping. The Cuomos philosophy was simple to do social, racial, and economic justice. We embrace men and women of every color, every creed, every orientation, every economic class. I believe that Andrew learned from his father, Mario, what justice really is. So at the age of just 28, he started Help USA in Brooklyn. It's a housing complex that provides previously homeless families with temporary housing and at the same time provides them with the on-site social services they need. He knew they needed more than just housing. They needed treatment for substance abuse, job training, and mental health treatment. It was incredible to watch as he tried to help a community that really needed it. In the 1980s, that was not only innovative, it was radical. One of the singular facts of Andrew Cuomo's public career, and it's only just beginning, is that he has devoted so much of his effort to this question of the homeless. Andrew was asked to join the Clinton administration as assistant secretary at HUD. In Clinton's second term, he served as HUD secretary, one of the youngest in history. I don't know if I've ever worked with a, a colleague who is so energetic and dynamic with new ideas. Cuomo used the resources and authority of HUD to aggressively fight discrimination. If you discriminate, it is illegal and we will enforce the law and we will stop it because it has no place in this country today. He sued the Ku Klux Klan, investigated black church burnings. And he pioneered the fight against gun violence, forging the safe gun agreement with Smith & Wesson. We need the Congress of the United States to pass this year common sense gun control legislation after the Clinton-Gore administration, he came back to New York and ran for governor unsuccessfully. He picked himself up, learned from the loss, and then ran for attorney general in 2006. He is a tireless worker and advocate. There's nobody who will fight harder. Andrew's work in the AG's office was the realization of the very things that he had been saying since he was a teenager and that he had pursued with and on behalf of his father when his father was governor.
My friends, I accept your nomination for the office of governor of the state of New York. When Andrew Cuomo was elected in 2010, it's not an understatement to say the state was a disaster. Not only did the governor focus on issues that hadn't been addressed for decades, but he really made New York the progressive capital of the nation once again. New York has become a beacon for the nation as Andrew has passed marriage equality, raised the minimum wage, and enacted common sense gun laws that have saved lives. He passed the strongest paid family leave in the nation. Equal rights for women. This is exactly the image progressive leadership believes in and delivers on. And made New York the first state in the nation to offer free college tuition for the middle class. What Governor Cuomo is proposing is a revolutionary idea for higher education. He passed historic criminal justice reform. From raise to age, to executive order on special prosecutor, he has matched the challenges that we've come up with. Andrew Cuomo fought for Puerto Rico when nobody else would. The sky was the limit, and every time we raised the bar, he raised it again. I to do the $15 minimum wage campaign, and I turned to the governor and I said, this is going to be a fight. And he said, the ones that are worth it always are. I think that if there is anything that drives Andrew and why Mario served the people of New York 12 years, it's because they want to do good. It is the nation's founding premise. It's the enduring promise. Summed up in just three words. E pluribus unum. Out of many, one. He not only had a concept, he had a follow through. Andrew took that gift, ran with it, made his father and his nation proud of him. I know a lot about the government of the state of New York, and Andrew has made it greater than it ever was. It will be greater still. At this time, may we have Janet DeFiore, Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals and the State of New York, step forward and administer the oath of office to Andrew M. Cuomo as Governor of the State of New York, accompanied by Ms. Sandra Lee, Mariah, Cara, and Michaela Kennedy Cuomo, and Mrs. Matilda Rafa Cuomo. Governor, you were reelected with more votes than anyone in the primary and the general election. And this evening, I'm so proud to be here to swear you in to continue to do the people's work every hour of every day. Thank you. Thank Please you. raise your right hand, sir, and repeat after me. I, Andrew Mark Cuomo. I, Andrew Mark Cuomo. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York and that I will faithfully discharge the duties and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of governor of the office of governor of the great state of, of New York of the great state of New York according to the best of my ability according to the best of my ability so, so help, help me, me god <laughs> You may be seated, and please welcome the governor of the state of New York, Andrew M. Cuomo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year to everyone. Great way to start the new year. Let's thank the uh, staff here at uh, this magnificent Ellis Island for keeping it open today for us and for their service.
Actually, come to think of it, the state is now paying them to keep Ellis Island open. And we are proud to do it because it would have been terrible if Ellis Island closed. That will never happen. Let me thank our great Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, Janet DeFiori. To Reverend Richardson, who we'll hear from in a moment, and Rabbi Schneier, thank you so much for your service to New York and your inspiration to all of us. Congratulations to my great partner in Albany, Kathy Hochul, who has been phenomenal. Congratulations to our great history-making Attorney General, first woman elected Attorney General in the history of the state of New York. And she wears two hats. She's also the first person of color ever elected to Attorney General of the state of New York. For your, for your information, I was Attorney General at one point, and this is one of those facts that nobody else would know. The proper protocol for the Attorney General is General James. So I salute you, General James. Congratulations. <laughs> to Thomas DiNapoli, who has been a phenomenal state, a uh, public servant. He served in the New York State Assembly. If you ever want to feel intimidated, come to the state of the state and have to enter the hall and hear the applause of Tom DiNapoli compared to everyone else. The Assembly loves him, and his applause dwarfs everyone else. He's been a phenomenal controller. 32 years of state public service. Tom DiNapoli, God bless you and thank you. I want to thank my whole family that's here today. Rabbi, we, we would say the whole, in Italian, the whole mishpucha is here, and I'd like to thank them. Let's give them a round of applause. We also have uh, our elected officials, and the, the Lieutenant Governor mentioned them. Uh, but let me begin with the greatest team that has ever served the state of New York, in my opinion, headed by Melissa DeRosa and Rob Mejic and Alfonso David and Stephanie Benton and Jill De, De, De Rosier. Let's give them a round of applause. Again, to the Court of Appeals, thank you for being here. Let's give them a round of applause and the members of Congress and the members of the State Assembly and the Senate. Mayor Bill de Blasio, thank you very much for being here, Mayor. Congressman Charles Rangel, the Lion of Lenox Avenue, Mayor David Dinkins, who brought us such pride as Mayor of New York. All our brothers and sisters in the labor movement, I thought you were here, but I can't hear you. I don't know. Thank you for being here. We've done great work together, and we're going to do more. Today, the first day of this new year and this new term, as we together we face a new reality, it's a day that not only calls for celebration, but perhaps even more importantly, my friends, for perspective. Because when they write the history books about this time and place, I believe they will record this period as one of global and national unrest, a time that saw thousands of new immigrants reaching our borders in search of hope, a time that saw troubled, frightened American citizens frustrated by economic stagnation and a deteriorating democracy have grave new doubts about where our country is headed. There is now a fundamental questioning of the viability of the American promise, a covenant that created our nation's founding 242 years ago. 
and reached full flower right here in this great hall for our ancestors yearning to breathe free, illuminated by the torch of the great lady in the harbor. A land that would work with you to lift you up to reach new heights as high as your wings and your work could carry you with individual freedom and equal rights for all. An American promise grounded on the theory that we would work together. This sacred compact has held firm through the centuries, through world wars, internal dissension, and economic depressions. Through it all, we overcame, we rallied as one, and we built the strongest nation on the globe. There is no other nation that can threaten us. America's only threat is from within. It is the growing division amongst us. The threat is when we see ourselves as black or white, foreign or native born, instead of as Americans, as Christians or Jews or Muslims, gay or straight, instead of as Americans. That, my friends, is truly frightening. And that is the threat that we face today. As our nation once confronted a great economic depression, we now confront a great social depression. People's frustration is turning to fear, and the fear is turning to anger, and the anger is turning to division. It is impossible to overstate how dangerous, how malignant this condition is. It is like a cancer that is spreading throughout our society, a disease that causes one cell in the body politic to attack other cells to turn one against one another. We see it almost every day now in the spreading anti-Semitism, in the growing number of white supremacist groups, in the KKK at Charlottesville, in the rage unleashed in the mass shootings from San Bernardino, California to Parkland, Florida. We see it in the homophobia that erupted into violence and death inside an Orlando nightclub, in the cruelty that breeds in the anonymity of the internet, in the misogyny and xenophobia and nationalism that for some now constitutes the political currency of the day. It may surprise you, but I don't fault our federal government for causing the underlying fear and frustration. But I fault them for something worse. I fault them for a failure of leadership and government malfeasance. I fault them, I fault them for manipulating and using the fear and deepening the divisions for their own political purpose. Like looters during a blackout, they didn't cause the darkness, but they exploited it. People's fear and frustration is caused by real problems in their lives. And there are two options for government leaders to take. The hard but true path is to confront and actually solve the problem. The easy but false path is to use the anger to blame someone else. And the easiest target to blame is always the people who are different. And this federal government has sought to demonize our differences and make our diversity our greatest weakness rather than our greatest strength. We always knew we always knew that the concept of e pluribus unum, forging one people from many different origins, would be difficult. We, difficult. we knew it. Pope Francis has said 
differences among people always scare us. But the differences create tension. And resolving that tension moves humanity forward. That tension has always been with us. And the notion of inciting it to try to divide and conquer is neither new nor novel. In fact, it is old and ugly. New York knows the challenge well. With our density and diversity, we have lived with it daily. But New York has always risen above hatred. When racism or sexism or discrimination rears its ugly head in our state, we come together, all of us united, to oppose the division. When they bring fists of fear and hate, we bring an embrace of love and hope. We know that when we come together at our darkest hours, that our finest days can follow. When they write the history books and they ask us, well, what did you do in the face of anger and division? What did you do when people were dis disillusioned? Let New York's answer be that in that defining moment, we brought healing and light and hope and progress and action. Let us say, let us say that New York did not seek to blame or use people's anger but rather chose the hard but true path to resolve the fear by solving the problems that were causing the frustration in the first place. Just as FDR turned the frustration of the economic depression into a movement to pass the New Deal, let New York use the fr frustration of the social depression to pass a new justice agenda, advancing social, <laughs> racial, and economic justice. And, let's, and let us address our issues, our very real issues, with a progressive agenda, not a regressive agenda, an agenda that moves us up, forward, and united, not down, backwards, and divided. Within my first 100 days, I will propose to the new Democratic legislature the most progressive agenda this state has ever seen, period. From voting reforms to Roe v. Wade for New York, to protecting a woman's right to choose, to better gun laws, to health care protection, to legalizing marijuana, to protecting the labor movement, to a Green New Deal, to real criminal justice reform. We will make history, and New York will move forward, not by building a wall, my friends, but by building new bridges and building new airports, and creating new middle-class jobs, and an economic future for the next generation, and showing us how good we can be at our best when we are together. My friends, our new legislature is thankfully now governed by Democrats. I feel liberated. I felt like I was fighting with one arm tied behind my back. And we will not repeat mistakes of the past. 
We know hollow campaign rhetoric and false political posturing only aggravates the frustration. New Yorkers are smart. They know there is no magic wand that we can wave. There is no single silver bullet. My father used to say, we don't need ideas that sound good, but rather ideas that are good and sound. <laughs> New Yorkers know the difference between rhetoric and results. We either perform by delivering real solutions that restore hope and progress in people's lives, or we fail. It is that simple. Either the government works or the government doesn't work. Either the government delivers or the government delivers. And if we don't deliver, we fail. But in New York, failure is not an option, my friends. We will get it done. And it won't be just what New York got done at this defining moment, but how we did it. The way we're going to do it is by bringing people together, Democrats and Republicans, upstate and downstate, young and old, all of us together. Because we believe in New York that we can be a people truly guided by our better angels. Because New York believes that our interconnection and interdependence come from our essential goodness. New York believes that your child's success is my child's success, that your acceptance is my acceptance, that your rejection is my rejection, that your respect and dignity is my respect and dignity. That is what we call community and connection. Our official state seal, our official state seal proclaims us the great state of New York. The question before us is how do we define great? Now in New York, we define great by the size of one's heart and the depth of one's character. That's what great means in New York. What makes New York great is that we will not tolerate hate in our state. That's what makes us great. What makes us great, what makes us great is that we believe and our credo is not only I love New York, but New York loves you. That's what New York is about. <laughs> that we reject the path of divide and conquer, and we accept the path that says unify and grow. That is what New York has done time and time again throughout history. Whenever this nation was in a dark period, whenever this nation was searching for its soul, they looked to New York and New York showed the way. We showed the way when we led the women's suffrage movement at Seneca Falls and were the first call for women's equality. We led the way right after the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, when we said safety for all workers and workers' rights have to be a priority. We led the way for the gay rights movement after Stonewall because we said true equality is equality and love doesn't discriminate. We showed the way when New York ended the sin of slavery 35 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. We showed the way forward when we rejected discrimination by electing the first Congresswoman to the United States of America, Shirley Chisholm.
and we showed the way recently, and they will write what the people in this room did into the history books. When we passed marriage equality and we changed the discourse in this nation, when we passed free college tuition so every child can go to college, when we passed the best paid family leave program and the smartest gun control law, the SAFE Act, and when we raised the minimum wage to $15, the highest in the nation, a 66% increase that goes into effect today and will change life for millions and millions of Americans. That's what we did. That is what we did. And we believe the promise that attracted 5,000 people a day to come from across the globe to this sacred place. Through this portal on Ellis Island, that this is not a faded memory of yesterday, but rather a shining beacon for a better tomorrow. <laughs> Ellis Island remains the place where Maud McCoy arrived from the poor island of Jamaica, whose son was educated in New York public schools and rose to become the United States Secretary of State, Colin Powell. It is the place, it is the place where Rose and Joseph Amster, Jewish immigrants from Austria, arrived whose Brooklyn-born granddaughter would become Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> this is the place, and this is the promise that made America, America. And no one can ever forget that. It doesn't matter how high one is raised, raised or what office ones occupy. Never forget where you came from, and never forget or deny this place, because this is the place where Richard Cawley arrived fleeing starvation in Ireland, and whose grandson is now Vice President Mike Pence. This is the harbor where Frederick Trump arrived from Germany, and whose grandson would become President of the United States. Don't you tell me Ellis Island isn't real and true and the promise that made America lives today because it does. That is my perspective today, my friends. January 1, is bittersweet for me. It's a happy day, but it's also a sad day. It is the anniversary of my father's death. Four years ago, his health was declining, but he promised that he would be with us until inauguration day. And he was. He heard my swearing in over the telephone from his bed, and he died soon afterwards. He was true to his word, always. He said he would be there for inaugural day, and he was there. I took him from his bed that afternoon, and we put him to rest. I loved him so, so, so much. We buried him with a special New York State necktie that I had made to wear for the inaugural. He loved it. It was the state colors, navy blue and gold, and it was adorned with the state seal. And today I stand here in his shoes. I learned this lesson of America and government from him and from my family. 
Congressman Rangel is right. I didn't get it from a book. I didn't get it from a political science course. I learned it in the kitchen from my father, from my grandparents. And it is in my DNA. My grandparents were the people at the southern border today. My mother's parents, Charles and Mary Rafa, and my father's mother, Immaculata, and his father, Andrea, who I am named after, came poor and alone through this very hall. Their names are on the wall. It wasn't easy. My grandparents would cry to their dying day when they talked about their journey and the hardship and the people they left behind and the stereotypes and the ugliness of discrimination and the slings and arrows, but they never gave up hope. And they made it, and they would proclaim, God bless America, as their tribute to this great nation. And that their son, and that their son went from behind their little grocery store in South Jamaica on the other side of the tracks where he was born, to occupy the highest seat in the greatest state, in the greatest nation, in the only world we know, proves the American success story once again. And that story has been replicated over and over and over again. My father may be gone, but he is still with me because I believe this spirit lives. I can hear his voice. And I can imagine his pain and anger if he could see his beloved country today. He would say, this is an outrage. This is un-American. It violates everything we fought for. It violates everything we believe in. And he would implore us all, each and every one, to stand against the tide, to fight back, and that New York should lead by example, by the power of our example, and lift up New York to show the nation the way forward. Show them the better way. And he would be right. And Pop, wherever you are, and I think I know where, I think I know where. Please give us the strength to fight this good fight, to resist the negative, to resist the hate mongers and the naysayers. Help us rise up and let New York say that the federal government may shut itself down, but it will never extinguish the Statue of Liberty's torch. It will never erase the words of her poem they will never close our harbor. They will never close our hearts. They will never close this hall of dreamers. They will never disrespect the legacy they left. That it is New York's duty. It is New York's destiny. It is New York's legacy to bring the light, to lead the way through the darkness and I pledge to the people of the state of New York, that's what we will do together. Thank you and God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please now welcome Grammy-nominated artist, Andra Day.
broken down and tired of living life on a merry-go-round and you can't find the fighter but i see it in you so we're gonna walk it out and Mountains, we gon' walk it out and move mountains. And I'll rise up, I'll rise like the day. I'll rise up, I'll rise unafraid. I'll rise up and I'll do it a thousand times again. Silence is in quiet, and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe. And I know you feel like dying, but I promise we'll take the world to its feet. Move mountains, bring it to its feet. Thank you, Governor Cuomo. God bless you all. Mwah.
Somebody wants to kill a guy. Can we pull him? Go with benediction? Yep. All right. As we gather now for this prayer of departure, we are excited about the enthusiasm that has filled this room and the challenging message of our governor. And we are resolved not to go out of this room the same way that we came but determined to be the healers, the healing that we seek. I want to invite you to join me in the closing prayer and benediction. Oh God, our mother and our father, we thank you for these powerful and inspiring moments that we have spent in this hallowed space, made sacred by the prayers of Native Americans and by the millions of men and women from around the world who found at this place the front porch of Freedom's House, a temple of liberty. We thank you for what we have felt here as we have defined afresh what it is that we are called to be and what we anticipate. We pray now that you would unite us, Holy One, that our diversity will be our greatest strength and our highest hopes and noblest aspirations will provide the map for our future. We thank you for the gallant stewardship of Mario, of Tom, of Andrew Cuomo and Mario Cuomo, for their joint legacy that fuels the future of this state. And we ask now, as we leave this island of new beginnings, that you will so inspire us that as we go into the uncharted waters of the future, that our governor, Governor Andrew Cuomo will be equipped with the capacity to move us forward. Give to him, continue to give to him, creative imagination, determination, vision, clear vision, and unrivaled wisdom that he may navigate this ship of state against the turbulent and fierce waters of these times that he may lead all of us into safe harbor, that those who are his passengers may find hope and healing. We thank you for his advocacy, for the values that have made America great. And now, we kindle in us, each of us, an allegiance to liberty and justice for all. Lord, bless us. Lord, cause your face to shine upon you. Lord, grant us your peace that we may so live together in this world. In the world to come, we shall fulfill your purpose and intention. Now bless the great state of New York. Empower us that we may for all states in this country, a fresh standard for America, that we may be vehicles of change and hope. And men and women who see us will come to know us as the light in the darkness. In your powerful name we pray, amen. This concludes today's inaugural ceremony.